Hello and welcome. So this is our hands-on video on linear regression. Before we start, let me tell you, this is a beginner-friendly video. While I'm calling it a beginner-friendly video, as you begin to watch this video, you will no longer be a beginner once you finish watching this video. We're going to uncover such interesting aspects about linear regression, which even some of the practitioners till date do not understand or struggle to understand. For example, we're going to talk about what is the importance of outliers and what is the best way to treat the outliers. Not in the most common way, but in the most genuine way. We're also going to answer questions like, should we perform scaling when we are doing linear regression? Is that mandatory or not? In addition, we'll also be learning the easiest method to check for the assumptions relative to linear regression in one go. So with that, let's get started. The data set that I'm going to talk about is a variant of a very popular data set known as the California Housing Data Set. It's available in the scikit-learn library as well, but I'm using a variant, not the exact same data. Still, we can use its reference to understand the features. So this data set is about predicting the house prices, and these houses are located in California. The features that we have are median income in block group. So what is a block? Block is the smallest geographical region. You can say that every region is divided into small blocks. So it's a small geography, small region, and they're looking at the income of the individuals living in that region. It kind of determines the locality, and it may have an influence on the price. Then we have the house age, when was the house constructed, how old the house is, that might again have an impact on the price. Then we have the average room. So this is not average room of one property. You will have average over a number of rooms in a block. Similarly, we have average bedroom. So if these variables show decimals, you shouldn't be worried as to how can there be a fractional bedroom. It is not a fractional bedroom because it's an average of a number of values. That's why it shows like so. Then we have the population, how populous is the area where the property is located. Then we have the average occupancy, which is the number of household members, how many people live there. Then we have variables like latitude and longitude, which are not present in our variant of the data at the time. So our variant is pretty close to this, which is close to 19,500 records. And that's what we'll be working with. Let's get started. So we are at Google Collaboratory, and I've already pointed to the data set that's available on my machine, which is known as the California Housing Data Set. We begin by importing the basic libraries like NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, and Seaborn, and then we simply read the data. It is customary to just check the first few records. I'm just checking the head of the data, and it shows that these are the values that have been given to us. This house price is the price in $100,000. We can always refer to the scikit-learn reference. You want to read more about this data set and its source. Coming back, we can check the dimensions of the data. How big is the data in terms of rows and columns? So we have 19,569 rows and seven columns. Now we are just doing the exploratory stuff right now. So we are also checking the info about the data, which will tell us about not just the dimensions, but also the data types and the presence of null values. So if we do that, we get to know dimensions in a way we already know, but we get to know uh, that all the data that we have is essentially a float type data. It will have decimals and we don't seem to have null values here in our data. It's, it's all it's showing as non-null value, which means the cells are all occupied, right? Same thing, if you want to check for non-null, we can always check using isNull.sum. These are just four or five basic steps that we need to perform just to get started with any data set. So get in the habit of it if you're a beginner. And then we are just looking at the descriptive stats of the data, essentially a five number summary and a couple of other statistical measures. So it'll show us the output for all the numerical features. So here you can see the minimum, maximum, the quantiles of the data, and that's pretty much about it. If you have differences between median and mean, what do you infer from it? You can always write some takeaways when you look at this data. Now, since all the data is of one type, which is numerical, we once again using a loop here to go over the data and generate the box plot images. We are using the enumerate method, which adds the indices to the data, which means if we have different column names, It'll identify them with an index 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on and so forth. And then we're just dividing the plotting grid into two rows and four columns and looking at the box plot for each variable. This tight layout is done to ensure that the plots are nicely separated. You see? So we have columns in our data which contain outliers, including the target column as well. And in fact, if you see, the average rooms, average bedrooms, population, and occupancy seem to have a lot of influence of outliers right now because of the presence of these extreme values, the box almost looks like a flat line, which is not a good sign. And imagine, how can there be a property which has 120 plus rooms? So is this an error? 
Well, if you read the description of the data set, you will find out there are such properties as well occupying a block where they have resorts or hotels. And a large-scale hotel could have multiple rooms, much more than a household. So such points participating in our data would really affect the interpretation of the data. Now, how do we go about treating the outliers? The most common way you would hear people do is that anything which is above the permissible limit or the upper limit, they bring it to the upper limit. But if you follow the right approach, this kind of treatment is applicable only if your outliers are very close to the limits, upper limit or lower limit. In case the outliers are as extreme as these are, this technique of bringing them to the upper limit would not be the right way. Then what should we do? Let's deliberate a little bit on this. First of all, let's check the 99th percentile of all the variables. So what is 99th percentile? Which means 99% of the values are below this particular threshold and only 1% of the points are ahead of this. So let's check this for each feature. So check this variable median income. The 99th percentile is 8.12. But what's the value? What's the maximum value it's taking currently in our data? So if we just keep it to 8.12, that will take care of the 99% of the values in the column. It's only for 1% of the values that we are worried about these many outliers. Similarly, if we check the 99th percentile of, let's say, the average rooms, that's 10.29. Look at this column. This box plot is all flat line because of the scale that it has taken. Your value is 10.2. So 10.2 would be somewhere here. If we consider this point as the upper limit of our data, we'll not be losing a lot of data because we'll be taking care of the common 99% of the data. We'll hardly be losing 1% of the data. So we are not going to follow that Q1 minus 1.5 IQR and Q3 plus 1.5 IQR in this case. We are going to rather follow this as the upper limit. And we will check if we keep this as the upper limit, how much data are we left with? Please note it will not be flat 1% for the overall data because each feature has these issues. So we'll have to check effectively how much data are we left with if we get rid of such rows which contain such extreme values. Once again, showing you the shape of the original data and then applying a filter. What is a filter? Filtering the values which are greater than the 99th percentile or below the first percentile and checking how many outliers do we have? There's kind of a check that you will do for missing values generally, but this simple line of code gives you the number of outliers by each column. So you get to know that median income only has 392 outliers. Imagine our data was 19,500. If we check it at above 99% or below 1%, only 392 such values are there. 392 appears a couple of times here, but it may not necessarily be in the same rows. So next what we are doing is we are kind of removing the values which are greater than the 99th percentile. We kind of are convinced that even if we remove this much data, we'll not be losing a lot of data compared to the overall data available to us. So what we're doing is that we are going over all the columns present in the list of columns, and we are saying our threshold is the 99th percentile for each column. If we encounter a value less than or equal to the threshold, we'll keep it back as the part of the data frame. We'll also check the dimensions of the data that's actually not affected by these extreme values. So if you see, we lost close to 1,100 values approximately, and we seem to have got rid of those extreme 1% values which were affecting most of the columns. But would this mean that all the outliers have been treated? We'll just check that in a while. If we had outliers at the lower end too, so for example, in our code, if you see most of the places where we have outliers, it seems like they are at the upper end. If we have outliers at the lower end too, we can execute this code as well which will just take care of the lower threshold and, and keep values which are greater than the lower threshold. Remember, it has to be less than the upper threshold and greater than the lower threshold. I'm leaving it for you to try it on your own now. Let's create the box plots again and see how's the scenario. Now. Okay, now this is something that bothers a lot of people who are new to this. They'll say, we treated outliers, but we still have outliers. Now, yes, you have outliers, but you don't have any idea of what was the impact of the outliers earlier versus what is the impact of outliers now. For example, if you recollect these columns like average rooms, average bedrooms, population, and average occupancy, these were looking like flat lines sometime back. At least you are able to examine the variable closely because this is the common range the variable attains. Now you don't have to keep on treating the outliers again and again. Remember, you treated the outliers with the logic of 99th percentile here but you're visualizing the outliers based on the old logic. What if we increase the size of the whiskers? 
So normally you do whiskers at 1.5 IQR. What if we increase it to three and do the same code again? Let's see how does it look like. See, so now only a few variables have outliers. And again, the quantum of outliers would be a lot less compared to the original data. So no data is ideal. You'll be really lucky to get a data which is in its perfect shape. But the point is, when we get a data, can we bring it to a stage where it is manageable without much deviation? So that's where we are right now. Most of the columns are treated now. Only a few columns have some extreme values, which we can manage. So this is a lot better compared to where we started. If you want, we can just cap these values or lower these values now. It would not affect much of the original data. But for now, we just choose to leave it as is. We are checking if these variables have any kind of correlation and we are checking it through a heat map. Remember, this was one of the assumptions for regression that the variables, the independent variables in particular, should not be correlated. There could be correlations between the target and the independent variables, but the explanatory features should not be correlated. So this heat map would help us check that exactly. We have rounded out the correlation values to two decimal places. We don't see anything very significant, at least for the independent variables. For the target, which is house price, we see one variable which has a decent correlation. I would not say a very strong, but it's a moderate correlation. The rest of the variables don't seem to have very strong correlation. Yes, median income and average rooms also seem to have a correlation. So probably people who have higher income prefer to live in big houses, which is common sense. But nothing is alarming here because no correlation that I see is greater than 0.8. Generally, that's the threshold we follow unless we are dealing with a very specific case. So correlation overall is not a problem for us. Let's once again check the head of the data because we've treated the data, we've removed some of the observations. One peculiar observation that comes here, and that's why I did this step again, is that the house age suddenly seems to be a constant. It may not be a constant because we are right now only looking at the first five values. But since you see something peculiar here, it will be worth exploring this column alone quickly. So we should get in the habit of checking these things even as we are exploring the data. If we see something unusual, it's worth exploring then and there. See, for house age, the first five values are just a coincidence because it actually occupies a range starting with one year to 52 years. Let's do a pair plot essentially to check the assumption on linearity. I'll show you a shortcut to check a lot of these assumptions at one go, but right now just doing the usual way to visually inspect if we have linear relationship between our target and the independent variables. So we don't want linear relationship within the independent variables, but we would want to see that with the target. Let's see if that's there or not. So it's kind of adding a scroll option, but if we scroll down, you can see we don't seem to have too many linear relationships here overall. And this could be a bit of a concern as well, because even with the target, most of the variables do not seem to be showing a good linear relationship. So is linear regression the right technique to apply. In a way, through the correlation matrix above, we again got a similar hint because there was just one variable which was significantly correlated. But this should not be the reason for us not to proceed with the rest of the analysis because there are more learnings in the process. Now, what we're doing next are a couple of standard steps that you'll be performing irrespective of which modeling approach you're trying. Right now, we are trying linear regression, but it could be another approach that you'll learn later. You'll find some of these steps will be repeated every time. For example, we start by separating the X and Y. X are the independent features and Y is the dependent variable. We just separate them because this is how the functions that we are going to use expect the inputs to be aligned. Now, since we've been given one single data, which is not partitioned, we are dividing the data into two parts, train and test. With the help of scikit-learn libraries model selection module, we are dividing the data into two parts, fixing the train size to the typical 70%, and the random state just to ensure that every time we get the same output. Because we are doing a random partition, it is quite likely that next time when we revisit this code, without this random state, it will give us a different data and the outputs would all be different. So we're just partitioning the data into two parts. We will reserve the training part for the machine learning exercise and we'll park the test data for validation. Now we are calling the linear regression model from scikit-learn. I'm going to show you two additional approaches and their interpretation as well. So just bear with me, calling the most common one, which is linear regression from scikit-learn. Scikit-learn happens to be the most popular machine learning library by far. We instantiating the model. This is how we are calling. We're calling it model one because that's how it is for us. And then there are standard steps. So once you instantiate the model, you have to do a fit, which is essentially where the learning happens. So you are giving the answers, which is the actual house price. And 
the inputs and you're trying to find a binding relationship between the two. So this is where the model is trained. So this completes the training of the model. And now, once the model is trained, we are going to do predict. Predict on what? Predict on train and predict on test. So we are generating the y hat values as we discussed in our theory video. And once we have the y hat values, it'll be fair to compare those y hat values against the actual values and see how good or bad we are doing. And how do we do this? We do this through coefficient of determination. Again, we discussed this in our theory video. We have to call this particular class called R square or R2 score as it's stated here. And then we'll need to pass the actual values and the predicted values and round them off to three decimal bases just for cosmetic purpose. We're printing both. So we seem to have got the R square on training as 56.2 and R square on test as 55.6. Obviously, this doesn't look like great R square value because R square can be a value in the range of 0 to 100. The, the higher it is, the better it is. But let's just see. One of the reasons I took this example is because when people are doing this for the first time, at times they expect the R square value to be always to the tune of 95% or 98% or something close to 100%, which may not be the case in a real world scenario. And you are not to be blamed for this. This depends on the quality of the data. So the important thing for you, if you're learning this for the first time, is that you should be able to interpret. Your results will be just as good as the data is. It's not your fault that the R square value is like this. You should be still able to interpret it and understand and explain it to people. So we have 55, 56% R square, which means for our house price, only 56% of the variability or 55% of the variability is explained by the variables that we have considered in our model. Let's check the coefficients. Remember, linear regression is about a linear equation where you have the variable and its coefficients. So these are the coefficient values that we got. This will be the coefficient of the first variable and so on and so forth. And we also have a constant term, which is known as the intercept, which is this value that we got. Now, somehow, though the scikit-learn model is pretty straightforward, from the interpretation perspective, it's not putting everything together at one place. You'll have to put a little more effort to do that. Now, there is an alternative approach using stacks model where we get a very interesting output which puts across everything that we need at one place. So let's do this. We are calling the regression linear model from the stats model library using ordinary least squares method. This is a different library, works with a slightly different syntax. So here the function is ordinary least squares where you need to mention y variable as the endogenous variable, that's another name, and x variables as the exogenous variable. You have to mention if you want to have intercept, you have to put a true here for the intercept separately. And once again, you do a fit and print the summary. So this is an interesting outcome that you get. This is kind of giving you a detailed output all at once. In fact, it's more than what you need to digest at once. But let's just look at this. So R square values again to the tune of 56%. So for training, it kind of matches. There's a slight difference in the working of these models. They use slightly different regularization and optimization techniques. Now, if you don't understand those terms, that's totally fine. This is an equally acceptable result. This is giving us a lot of other output like AIC, BIC values, which essentially represents the loss of information. These values do not have a benchmark. You know, the lower it is, the better it is. But let's not get into the points that we've not discussed. Let's rather interpret the outcome of the model. So here we have the coefficients and notice these coefficients again vary a little bit compared to the original coefficients. For example, for median income, I have 0.575 and here it was 0.576. For house age, I have a 0 0.016 rounded off. This is approximately the same. For the third one, this is 0.276 negative and this is 0.277. So pretty close, but not exactly identical. All these features have a p-value. What is the interpretation of this p-value? If this p-value is greater than 0.05, it means that the variable is not significant for your model, which means its coefficient is as good as zero. But in our case, none of the values that we see is greater than 0.05, which means all the variables that we have considered are significant. Now, why I like this outcome a little more is because it checks for all the assumptions relative to regression at once. So there are two tests that it performs for the assumption of normality. And there is a Harke Bera test. This is pronounced Harke Bera, not Jark Bera or Jark Q Bera. It's Harke Bera test. Now, the p value here being zero means that our error terms do not follow the normal distribution. This was one of the assumptions that we discussed at length. We assume the error to be normally distributed because that's how random data is supposed to be. 
but in our case looks like the error term is not normally distributed why and that's not too much of a surprise because if you see a model it is not a very good model so probably it's leaving some information to the noise so our error terms or residuals are not normally distributed this assumption is violated then then this output also checks for something that's known as the autocorrelation what is autocorrelation are the error values correlated with each other so if this value is very close to 2 it indicates the absence of autocorrelation in our case this is nearly close to 2 so we can say that we don't seem to have autocorrelation as a major problem here and skewness and kurtosis which are the properties of normal distribution basically have been checked by the herkebera test already this condition number checks for the multicollinearity in the data and a high condition number, a condition number greater than 100, typically indicates the data has multicollinearity. We did not see that there when we checked the correlation matrix, but there are different ways to check that further. In fact, we can perform a specific test for multicollinearity, such as Bartlett tests, etc. So overall, this indicates that most of the assumptions relative to linear regression are not satisfied. Just to go in the sequence, our data, our independent variables are not linearly associated with the target. We saw that visually. Our error terms are not normally distributed. That's again something we've checked here through the omnibus test and the Herkebera test. And the condition number suggests there is some amount of multicollinearity as well through a test. So the reason we took this example is because we should understand that in real world applications, majority of the time, some of the other assumption would not be satisfied. But let's just check the outcome. If we do a prediction using this model, even though the assumptions are not in place, if we still go ahead and execute this code, which is generating the predictions, a slightly different way because the syntax of this library is a little different. We can get the R square value, and this is again 0.556. So the R square value is 0.556, which is pretty close to the value that we got here as well. So the R square value for train was 0.562, which we got from scikit-learn, and the stats model and the test R square value is 0.556 for both the cases. Even though there are slight differences in the coefficients, the model performance is fairly close. And if you want to check the coefficients here, just for comparison purposes, you can print those coefficients using the parameters. Now there is another way, the classic way of doing this regression through stats model, which is what I'm going to show you now. Why I showed you this approach first is because this is more aligned to the way scikit-learn also accepts the data. The pain in the classic approach is that here you need to provide a model equation. You have to tell what is your dependent variable and you have to write the names of all independent variables like this, which is manageable if you have six or seven columns. But imagine if you have, let's say 50 or 100 columns, would you be typing all the names? That becomes very complicated and cumbersome. So showing you the last approach, which is one and the same, but with a slight different syntax in the same library. This again gives you a model summary, pretty similar to what we got earlier, but I'm not evaluating this now. Again, it shows same kind of output with respect to the assumptions. Now, there is a very common question that I often face that should we scale the data when we are performing linear regression or not? The answer to that question will be validated here. So let's just call the standard scaler and perform a scaling for the train data. Original data we had was not on the same scale. Notice the variables have different scales. For example, some variable is in hundreds, some variable is in units, some variable is double digits, which is in tens. So original data was not on the same scale. Would there be a difference in terms of outcomes if we scale the data? Let's check that. So here we are scaling the train data. Here is the comparison between the original data and the scale data. Now, obviously, the scale data has been limited to a range of minus 3 to 3 in 99% plus cases because it's fitting the standard normal distribution. But what's more important for us as a takeaway is that how does it affect the coefficients when we scale the data? And how does it affect the linear regression model's performance? So from a model performance perspective, if you were to just look at the R square value, whether we have scaled the data or not scaled the data would not make much of a difference. But when it comes to the coefficients, it does make a difference. For example, for the model prepared on the unscaled data, you can see the coefficient values are different. As for this, the median income, which is the first variable, gets a coefficient of 0.575, whereas the average bedrooms gets a coefficient of 1.43. Now you can imagine 1.43 is of course greater than 0.575. It, it gives an impression as if the average number of bedrooms have a higher influence on the price compared to the locality or the median income of the people living in that region. But if you look at it on the scaled data, th these values look quite different. Actually, the coefficient for median income is 0.83 and the coefficient of 
the average bedrooms is 0.13 or 0.14 rounded up. There is a significant difference. This value is many a times greater compared to this value. So if your objective is just to predict the outcome and look at the model performance, you can manage without scaling the data. But if you have to interpret the coefficients, then it becomes mandatory for you to scale the data. And one of the main reasons why linear regression still is surviving is because of its interpretability. We discussed why linear regression is still popular, and the answer was its simplicity. When it comes to simplicity, the interpretation of these coefficients plays a very important role. So to summarize, we discussed linear regression from multiple perspectives. The preparation of the data required us to deal with outliers, and we dealt with it in a very different way. Plus, we deliberated on the assumptions, the basic assumptions related to linear regression, which come out pretty handy if we use the stats model library, the classic output or this output, which is more aligned to scikit-learn's way of accepting inputs. Uh, we discussed both, and we also discussed the importance of scaling, which is not mandatory if you have to just look at the outcome, but becomes mandatory if you have to interpret the coefficients. Hope this video had some learnings for you. Thank you.